Hi guys, welcome back. I hope you're all doing good and your studying's going well. So today I thought I would talk about a stroke, also known as a CVA. Um, by no means is this video going to cover every single detail about a stroke and every side effect and every intervention or every evaluation technique, but I thought I would put together the most key points that I found were important on just understanding the whole concept. So let's get right into it. So what exactly causes a stroke? A stroke is when there's a neurological dysfunction that's caused by a lesion in your brain. And the picture on the right here does a good job at showing that lesion in the bottom right picture. And there's different types of strokes. The first one, a schema, can result from a brain embolism. Um, a hemorrhage is probably the most common. It's about 13% of strokes. Um, an aneurysm can result from that hemorrhage and can have similar treatment strategies. And then this last one, TIA, is the abbreviation. And this can result from a vascular disease in the brain. And it may be mild. Um, it can be single or repetitive, and these are sometimes referred to as mini-strokes. So with this stroke will come common impairments and limitations that your client may experience. So the first one is motor dysfunction. Um, that is going to be described as hemiplegia. Hemiplegia means paralysis to one side of the body. So if you have a left CVA, it produces a right hemiplegia. And then if you have a right CVA, it produces left hemiplegia. So basically, whatever side of the brain is affected, it affects the opposite part of your body. Just a little fun fact for you. The next one is trunk and posture control. So this is going to increase risk for falls. It's going to limit their functional activity, and it's going to decrease their independence in ADLs as well. There's also going to be impairment in any sort of standing or standing activity. It's going to affect their weight-bearing skills, how they weight shift, and how they step and walk. And again, this will also increase their risk for falls. Um, communication can be anywhere from mild to severe. On the next slide, I'll talk to you guys about aphasia. That's going to go along with the communication impairment. Um, cognitive and perceptual impairment. So these are a lot. This is going to have difficulty with their spatial neglect, their body neglect, um, figure ground, attention, orientation. I go into different intervention approaches for each one towards the end, but just knowing that there are cognitive impairments as well and ignore that last bullet. It got slipped in there by accident. So aphasia is a neurological language disorder, and there can be four different types of aphasia. The first one is called global aphasia. This is a loss of all language ability. So I like to think of global and all. Global means around the world. It includes everybody. This one is going to include all language lost. The next one is Broca's aphasia. This is broken speech. I like to think be in Broca and be in broken. So this is going to be slow, labored speech with frequent um, mispronunciation. See, I just, I did an example and I didn't even mean to. <laughs> the next one is um, Workin's aphasia. This is impaired auditory reception. So unlike Broca, where you only have these short chunks of sentences, this person is going to be able to speak fluently. But it's meaningless and it's nonsense. You won't understand what they're saying or what they mean, but it's sad because to that person, they are making sense. They just can't put together a complete thought that makes sense to you. And then the last one is autonomic aphasia, and this is difficulty finding the words. You know it in your head, but you just can't get it out. So evaluation, you want this evaluation to be client-centered. You want to be using client-centered assessments that's using a top-down approach. 
So for example, let's say you wanted to assess self-care with a client. How would you do that? Observation would be a big one. For example, this little guy on the right here, you would observe him donning a shirt, doffing a shirt, taking notes. And let's say you wanted to assess performance skills. What would that look like? It can be very different. Um, the two down below that I have are just two formal tests that I picked out of you know, nine or 10. The first one is the Berg balance test. You can see there's different um, directions that you'd give. You'd score it from zero to four. And then the second one that I have is the functional test for hemiplegic upper extremity. Same thing, pretty straightforward. There's a ton of them. You just have to pick which one works for you and which one works for your patient. I found that with a lot of the other neurological impairments, the phases of recovery are broken down to about three sections. Stroke can be broken down into the acute phase, so that's immediately following the stroke. Rehabilitation phase, which is where you're going to be performing most of these um, evaluations and interventions. And then community or continuing adjustment phase. All right, interventions, we're almost there. So interventions for stroke rehab should use a task-oriented approach. Um, this has shown significant effectiveness in stroke rehab. When you are doing these interventions, try to make the treatment environment mimic reality as much as possible. So for example, if you're working on meal prep, get yourself in the kitchen, um, something that's familiar to the client. So different methods of intervention are in the upper right-hand corner. These are postural adaption, motor learning, upper extremity function, things like that. Now, when I see those words, it's difficult for me to put that to a specific intervention. Okay, postural adaption. What could you do for postural adaption? Under it could be sitting, reaching, maintaining trunk midline. That's the first picture. Those are all different reaching activities. And then for motor learning, um, for example, if you have body neglect, that girl right there, she's using mirror therapy. So that's another form of intervention. So as you'll see on the next couple slides, I like to use pictures of different interventions. They're not every intervention out there that you could use, but it's just a few just so you can get a visual idea. And you can always go on YouTube and just look up, you know, uh, motor learning interventions, OT, or kitchen prep, um, things like that. So that helps me. All right, a few more intervention pictures. The one on the left are kitchen activities. These are certain ones you can do while standing, so you can get them in a simulated kitchen and work on washing dishes, making sure that they're weight-bearing properly. Um, if they're having problems with equilibrium, whoa, equilibrium, there we go. Um, you can do beam walking. This is also really good for clients with TBI. And then the last one is motor apraxia. So sequencing, things like that, you can have them prepare a small meal. And here are just a few more. One key point that I want to point out is always include the effective upper extremity in any functional task to help promote awareness and use. So that client should always be facilitating active positioning of that extremity. While they're eating, while they're grooming, they can use it to stabilize certain things. The man in the green just sitting down, making sure to properly position it. We made it! So again, this is not everything there is about strokes. Always make sure to go back, review. I just wanted to try to condense everything that I found most important with strokes. So hopefully you found it informative. Um, just three things to remember. Always make sure to match the activities with the client's current skill level. Be patient with them. Allow adequate time for them to respond, making eye contact. Um, good nonverbal skills, and focus on improving their participation in ADLs that are important to them. So thank you guys for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment if you have another suggestion. Bye!